thank you for, for taking care of that. We needed to get that taken care of. So Gil's been taking some information from you folks about Winter Field Day. And if you're interested in Winter Field Day or if you know other members of the club that are interested in Winter Field Day, it's, it's an event. Um, I don't know how excited I am about going out and freezing my keister off, but I'll probably be there. We're going to do our best to keep it warm out there. There is a, a shed that's out there that has a wood-burning stove in it. Uh, if we don't operate from inside there, we will definitely have it warm anyway for people to sit around, talk, whatever you think you might want to do while you're, while you're out there. Um, we also have some room. I don't know... Gil, what was your plan for trailers? Are you going to bring a couple, there's a couple okay, people? Okay, so I'm planning on bringing my toy hauler and setting it up, and we'll use that as operating position number one. Uh, there will be room for two people. I guess I'll come up there. <laughs> there will be room for two people to operate inside my trailer. It will be heated. There won't be any water. There won't be any potty. There won't be anything like that. It will just be warm and dry to operate from. Uh, Mike Wild KJ7HEX is offered to bring his toy hauler out. It will be operating position number two. And again, it will be a dry dry camper, no, no water, no facilities at all. Uh, but it will be warm and it will be dry. So those will be our two operating positions. Unfortunately, the trailers are such that they're probably not big enough that we can all get in and, and see what's going on. Okay, but we can get two people set it, you know, sit down, and you know, people can maybe stick their head in or walk in and see what's going on a little bit. But we won't have a lot of room to gather. So we're going to go out there this this afternoon and, and check out the the. There's a shed, shed. That's out there. Yeah, and and it's got uh, a wood burning stove in it, and if there's room in there, that might be a place where you know, if you want to come out early and wait for your operating time to come up or whatever. Uh, you'll be able to stay warm, be able to mingle, talk with other folks, and stuff like that. So I don't. Oh. The, the shed used to hold the old Massey in it, and since that's been sold off, it's been pretty well empty since then. So okay. It should just be a big empty space. Uh, it is home to several cats. Uh, they are not people friendly, <coughs> the, you know, farm cats. Um, so we will try to uh, uh, corner off a small area in the back so that they'll stay there and hide from us and leave us alone. But uh, it shouldn't so, be a problem. Unfortunately, this probably is not going to be a social event. <laughs> it's going to be an operating event. We've never done this before. Uh, we want to do a. We want to have a good showing, and so we're our, we are looking for people that that want to operate. And there will be other operators on the air, so there will be contacts to be made. We'll be using uh, phone. We'll be using CW. And you're welcome if you're a, CD or a, a, a digital operator. We need a digital operator if somebody wants to operate Digi. Unfortunately, FT8 does not qualify. So please don't come out and go, okay, I want to operate on FT8. That's not an authorized digital mode for winter field day. Okay. PSK31, Olivia, uh, Hell Schreiber, however you pronounce it. Yeah. Every, everything else is, is uh, certainly on the table and available for you. But uh, phone and CW will probably be our go-to. We'll probably work mostly 20 and 80 meters. If we get a 10 meter opening, I'm going to be praying for that. That should be a lot of fun. There's a big one going on right now, that way. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> there, was a, there was a JS8 call um, contest going on last weekend. Um, so there's there are times where you can use those type of things, but I guess Winter Field Day is not one of them. So. No, you can't get it. It's <coughs> supposed to simulate emergency setup preparedness conditions. And you really can't do that with FTA FD8. does not allow you to do that. Any any other questions or thoughts? What what's the times on this event? Okay, so it's a 24 hour event, 29th and 30th. The operating event will start at noon and go till noon Sunday, okay, for our time zone. Uh, we will set up about three hours earlier. That's why I was looking for volunteers. We've got uh, antennas to set up and radios to run and coax and the trailers and, and all that kind of stuff. And then we'll tear down at noon. It should only take us about an hour, hour and a half to tear down on, on 
Sunday. It usually goes pretty quick. And then we're going to offer one hour operating slots uh, throughout the day. So at two stations, that gives us a potential of 48, 48 hours to operate. So there should be something that's available. But I admit 10 to 6 in the morning is not real, not real exciting. So we dropped 16 out of the 48. That's still 32 hours. That's a lot of time to operate and come out and try your hand. And if you're new to HF, this is a great way to get uh, introduced into the HF bands and, and the contacts you can make. I'm sure we'll cover all the states, and I don't know. Um, you don't know what DX might roll in. And I will tell you that the young ladies seem to really do really well on phone. Um, I, I, I don't know what it is, but it, 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 it's just a fact. Field day several years ago, we had somebody trying to work on the Christmas Islands or something. It was it was a mess. It, it was, was a, a pile it was from heck. island somewhere out in the South Pacific. And one operator was there. A couple operators tried for well over 45 minutes trying to break this pile up and get through. <laughs> and uh, Andrea came in. Uh, she made two calls. <laughs> the second call, the operator on the other end says, okay, everybody be quiet. Just the YL, just the young lady. And, you know, within 30 seconds, boom, she made the contact. So, yeah, we need you on the air. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is amazing. That and, and uh, younger operators, uh, kids, kids yeah. they tend to do really well on these contests. Everybody wants because to talk to the kids. Everybody, the, the, the people that are getting pile-ups, to them, we all look alike, okay? <laughs> but when they hear something different on the air, a, a female voice or a young kid's voice, they will stop <laughs> everything to talk to them because it's as much a boon for them as it is for that operator. So uh, it's kind of one of those mutual things that really does work out really well. So we like to throw in a few YLs here and there and some kid operators. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. I don't want to take a lot more of your time than Mike's time. <laughs> so that's that's great. Thank you. So that's one. That's the one big thing we have going on this month. Um, next month we have the. Uh, um, where is he? Uh, Mel Park's back there. We have the Utah VHF Society's swap meet, and that's the last Saturday of the month, right? That's correct. Okay. So February last Saturday of the month. Um, it's down there at the uh, Davis the Event Center in Farmington. Right, it's the the fairgrounds Davis down there, Fair right? Um, uh, there'll be more information on our website, on the Utah VHF Society's <coughs> website. Uh, it's a great opportunity to buy stuff, or if you have some things to sell, uh, to sell off some stuff that you have. Um, really sorry about this morning. Uh, we're making do the best we can. Um, I had it scheduled down there. They said that we would have to be up in the parade room uh, because there was some kind of a jousting thing. I don't know what this military stuff is. So jousting thing going on where they had reserved the uh, the, the where do you, you know, the gym and where do you eat food? What's that? Cafeteria and some other rooms. And so they had it all reserved. So we ended up upstairs. And then we get there this morning, and there's nobody there. I've tried to contact a couple of different people, and I still have not received any replies or responses back. So, um, sorry about that, but we're making do with the best we can. I hope that those people that didn't make it up here uh, aren't going to be too upset about it. Um, <coughs> this is one of those things where we just do what we do, right? Can't set up and operate in one place. We find another place where we can set up and operate. I was one of the last ones to leave over there, and there was a band that pulled in. Oh. With the dog? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you made it over here? All right. Um, I, I'm sure we'll miss a few people, and we'll just explain that next month when we get together. Um, so I'm not going to take up any more of your time, really. I do need to mention a couple of uh, business things really quick. Uh, the repeaters that we have up and running on Little Mountain and up here at, at uh, Mount Ogden. Um, they're there for our use. And there's a lot of rules and regulations and stuff through the FCC, and not just through the FCC, but through our, uh, our trust holders for these repeaters and for our, our club's call sign and other things. It's a privilege to use these repeaters, okay? 
we need to make sure that as we use our radios, as we use the repeaters, that we're courteous and everything else on the air with other people. And that includes not kerchunking the repeater. Okay? Don't just click your push to talk button. It's happening a lot. If you hit that push to talk button, you need to ID. It's the FCC's rules. If you don't ID and it becomes a problem and someone complains to the ARRL or to the FCC, we can have an issue. They can come in, they can do an investigation, they can try and figure out what's going on, and they're going to have our names on their lists. That's the last thing in the world that we want. Okay. If you accidentally hit the push to talk button, if it's an accident, hit it again and say, whoops, and identify yourself, KD7GR, whatever your call sign is, all right? It's not that big a deal, okay? Just anytime you're going to use the repeater, I know it says in the rules that you're supposed to ID every 10 minutes and at the end of your transmission. It doesn't say anything about the beginning of your transmission. But usually it's a good idea to ID at the beginning of your transmission as well. If you get into that habit, it becomes commonplace. You'll do it all the time. We won't have this kerchunking problem. Or if we do have the kerchunking problem, at least we'll know where it's coming from and who to help out with their radio setup so that it doesn't happen as much anymore. Uh, it's, it's become an issue. Um, as you know, we were having some problems with the uh, APRS uh, packets coming over the repeater. Um, we think that problem's resolved. Uh, it hasn't happened again in a little while, which is, which is the whole point. Uh, I hope we were able to help. I know there was a couple of people that we had ended up <coughs> talking to about getting their their, their uh, radio set up properly. Um, if you have a radio that does APRS and you're not sure how it works, get hold of someone in the club, some any other people in the club. I've got an APRS radio. I know Scott's got several. Um, Stan knows his way around. I don't know how many radios. Uh, we've got a lot of people in the club that are very willing and able to help you make sure that your APRS and everything is set up properly so that uh, so that it doesn't try to go out over the over the repeater. Um, other than that, um, I'm welcoming you all here to our club meeting. We've got uh, Mike who's going to be doing this antenna basics and modeling which is going to be very interesting, I think. You're going to show us the software, right? Mm -hmm. And I heard something. Someone said that the software is going to be available for free. The guy's retiring. I'll cover yeah. that. <clears throat> You'll cover that? Okay. So that's even a, a, a really much better piece of news there because it used to cost a little bit to pick up that software. So, all right. So uh, I'll uh, shut my pie hole and let uh, Mike get back to doing his thing. Okay, I actually got a microphone as long as I lean forward, but it's either leaning forward or standing up and leaning over, because these things aren't built for tall people. <coughs> but uh, I'm Mike Fulberg, KZ70, um, and my presentation is about antennas, in particular a few basics before we get into the antenna modeling. Antenna modeling is how do we put our antenna system, whatever it may be, into a computer program and see what it does. Because there are computer programs that uh, allow us to do that. And we'll get into that here in a few minutes. Um, I have an, a personal interest in playing with antennas. Over the years, I've played with lots of antennas. In particular, I've played probably more with VHF antennas than HF, but I've done a lot of both. Um, Years and years and years ago, uh, back when I was in college, um, I was a new ham, and um, my final year in the electrical engineering program at Utah State, they offered a class um, It was called antennas. And I knew what an antenna was. I'd been a ham for several years, but I had no idea all the details that went into it. Now, this was a theoretical class, and we took uh, little microwave antennas, and they had a little little range with a disc that rotated little antennas around, and you could plot patterns and do all kinds of things. And we uh, wrote little basic programs on how to uh, combine little vertical antennas together to create directivity to them. 
I don't know how many of you realize an AM radio station, um, which is a typically a two or three hundred foot tall <coughs> antenna tower. That whole tower is the antenna for an AM radio station. It's not just holding up a little antenna at the top. But most AM radio stations have more than one. They have two or three or sometimes four. Um, you go down 215 um, you go on Legacy, just as you get up on Legacy, about halfway down on Legacy, there's an AM radio station tower set up. I think there's four of them, if I remember right. And they are all exactly positioned where the FCC told them they had to put them, and they feed them with the exact amount of power in the exact phase relationship to steer the antenna pattern. The FCC will actually dictate to them that you can put so much signal in this direction, but you cannot put very much signal in this direction. And they control that by how they feed the antennas and the amount of power they do. And that's why you see multiple towers. And I wrote a, a those of you who remember the days of uh, BASIC, I wrote a BASIC program on um, plotting those patterns using vertical antennas. And so I've had an interest in antennas for years. <clears throat> it's fun. Um, I live in a little city lot. I can't put up 300 foot wire antennas for HF in my lot. Uh, I have to put up small antennas. Um, and so I've learned to live with that and put up little antennas, or at least ones that don't spread out very far, because I've gone up. I just can't go out. And so I've experimented a lot with VHF antennas more than anything. I really got into two meter VHF type antennas of all kinds and varieties and, and things. <clears throat> so what I want to do this morning is I want to give a, a brief review of some antenna basics because I think you need to understand the basics and then we'll go into the modeling program and we'll talk about that. And so we'll just go right into this. <clears throat> First off, Antennas really are black magic to most people. They don't know the math behind them. They don't know exactly how they work, but they learn to live with it. You may not understand the math or know why the antenna does all the things it does, but you can learn the basic things about how to use them and how to work with the black magic. Because it really becomes an art at learning how to use the black magic sometimes. If you understand the basic context, concepts, it goes a long way to your being able to install an antenna that works. A few definitions. <clears throat> now I'm going to ask some questions and I expect some participation. Horizontal and vertical polarization. What is horizontal polarization? Horizon. <laughs> An antenna, horizontal, okay? That is a horizontal antenna. <clears throat> and depending on which radio service you're involved with, they're usually transmitted, some horizontal and some vertical. FM radio stations <coughs> all transmit horizontal. TV radio, TV transmits horizontal. AM radio stations are all vertical. That's become a standard. <clears throat> now, if you're horizontal and you have a vertical antenna, can you hear the signal? Yeah. Yes, you can. It's just a lot weaker. You lose a lot of it when you change that. But there's standards in the industry. 2 meter FM, <clears throat> or almost all 2 meter 440 FM, is it horizontal <coughs> or vertical? It is vertical. That is correct. What happens if your two meter single sideband? It's horizontal. And those are standards. And you can reverse it, but you lose a lot of your signal strength when you do that. So you need to understand antennas can be vertical or horizontal. We're not going to get into the other kinds because there are other <coughs> polarizations, such as circular, which we won't talk about. What's that? No. <laughs> but I have done circular. I heard an oval. That was a 
have a natural sequence for it. So there's other ways of doing it, but those are the basic ones, horizontal or vertical. <coughs> okay, for those of you who need a little bit clearer understanding, did you realize that if you ever owned a pair of polarized sunglasses, they are polarized. Which way are they polarized? They're vertical. They are. They are. That's correct. It's affected more because the bars are this way. It affects. Uh, yeah. Most polarized sunglasses are polarized vertical because most reflections off water or shiny things come off horizontal. And so, so it cancels it out. If you're at a lake, if you do a lot of fishing in the summertime at a lake or a stream, like up in the Uintas or wherever, and you want to see out in the water 15 feet, the sun is shining on the surface, you wear a pair of polarized sunglasses, and now you can see down into the water. <laughs> yeah. Give you kind of an example. Uh, you go to the optometrist, and he gives you a prescription for new glasses. And they will determine a or the glasses he's got going to support what he's got to have. Mm -hmm. And they will ask you. Which is a little bit different than the polarization. It is. It, um, it is. Uh, 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 <coughs> you know that you're going to be going this way, and if you go this way and look up here, yeah, it's, it's got to be that way. Right. So we have to understand our polarization on our antennas, and in the modeling we need to understand, <coughs> okay, is, is the antenna this way or this way? Because it does make a big difference. Okay. Dipole. Monopole. What is a dipole? The definition of a dipole. Two elements. Two elements, correct. Di stands for two. One, two. That is a dipole. In the technical term of it, it doesn't matter which way they go, there's two elements. Dipole. What is a monopole? A monopole, one element. That's classified as a monopole. Those are the two basic kinds of antennas, and there's all variations of each. When we talk about a monopole, typically, when it's in that position, what's the other name that we give it? A vertical. They're almost always vertical when they're monopoles, but they don't have to be, because I can mount it like this. It's horizontal, but it's not common to do that. But so we typically call a vertical, a vertical is going to be a monopole. Now there's other exceptions to everything. Everything with antennas has exceptions, but we won't get into all the weird things. <laughs> antennas have an impedance. <coughs> The impedance is, we, in a simplistic way, it's the resistance of the antenna at the feed point. Your radios are designed for what impedance on the output? 50 ohms. If you want an antenna that works well and matches your radio, what does it have to be? 50 ohms. Now that 50 ohms, <clears throat> There's three components to it, and I won't get into the real technical details of the components, but there's the resistance, and the capacitance, and the inductance. And when we get into the modeling, those three things become very important. 
And it has to do, well, we'll get into what controls it, whether they're high or low or all the details. And then we're not going to get into the matching of it, of how to make it match. That's a whole different discussion. That you can have Gene or somebody talk about that. That's a whole <laughs> different discussion. Question? Well, one of the things that I use, and maybe you can correct me if I, my uh, assumptions are wrong, but I look at impedance so that it doesn't get too complicated in my mind as RF resistance as opposed to DC resistance. It is correct. It is an RF resistance. If you hook up an, an ohm meter, you won't measure it. It's strictly the impedance or the resistance kind of that you would calculate using RF equipment. You can't measure it with a typical $30 ohm meter that you buy at the store. It's more complicated than that. But they are different. And all three of those components come together in creating this 50 ohms. The idea in an antenna is to make the resistance around 50 ohms as best you can, and then to try to get rid of the capacitance and inductance with some sort of matching network of some kind. Wavelength. What is the wavelength? Someone give me a definition of the wavelength. It's the distance that the <coughs> wave at a certain frequency will travel in feet or meters for one complete wave cycle. Yes. A wave travels like a, well, if you all took the test, you all have a basic introduction to a sine wave. It's the length of the sine wave for one complete cycle is the wave length. If we talk about this antenna again, that's a two meter antenna in wavelengths. How long is it? A quarter wavelength. Just a standard. Those who are familiar with how long antennas are, that's a quarter wavelength antenna for two meters. It's approximately 19 to 20 inches tall. Quarter wavelength. And so if that's if we say that's 20 inches, quarter wavelength, how long is a wavelength? And if you come up with a rough approximation in round numbers, how many meters is that? Two. <coughs> yes. A two meter band, they specify it by the wavelength. On HF, if you're going to get on 80 meter band, how long is the wavelength approximately? 80 meters. We call our bands by the meter length of the wavelength. Now you start to get away from that when you get above two meters. If you get up to 440, you can still do that, but they start just going on the frequency and you start leaving the wavelength behind sometimes because they get really short. And it gets harder to define them. The 70, minim 70 centimeters band is the 440 band, but that gets shorter and shorter and so a lot of people just call it 440. Okay, there's the, free, there's the calculation. It's easy to do. There's other numbers. I, this is the one that I remember all the time. 300 divided by the frequency in megahertz, and it gives you the answer in meters. And then you convert that to whatever you want to do, inches, feet, whatever you want to convert it to. But that's the basic formula. Okay, radiation pattern. What's the radiation pattern of an antenna? It's sitting there in front of you in the white box. Yeah, oh, exactly right. That depends on the antenna. <laughs> the radiation pattern is where is your antenna radiating? This, this antenna radiates off the sides, the donuts. It produces a nice pattern, circular, off the sides in all directions. If I want to give this antenna a little bit of more gain, I have to squish it. It's the same energy involved, but I could squish it and mold it and make it go out in different directions. If you take a balloon that's blown up nice and round and you squish it, the air is going to push out to the side. You can change that radiation pattern 
by playing with your antenna. And it depends on where you want to send your signal will determine what you do with your antenna and what kind of antenna you put up. And we'll demonstrate that here now in a few minutes. That is all important in your antenna, is that radiation pattern. Because if you want to talk to somebody on two meters down in Salt Lake, you need a, or an antenna that's going to put all of your signal in a nice horizontal path down to Salt Lake. So the radiation pattern is highly important. Okay, the last one is resonant. And that's an important term when you get into the modeling. What is resonant? That doesn't seem to be as easily defined. So, so yeah, but it's so that the uh, the <clears throat> the energy at the frequency you're uh, operating at uh, comes out at an even in an even radiation pattern at the length of the antenna. You don't chop off uh, either short or long that wavelength uh, matches the length of the antenna. That is correct. And to add a little bit of explanation to that, we talk about the resistance, inductance, and capacitance all forming together to create this impedance. The resonant point is when the resistance goes to right on the, yeah. excuse me, it's the inductance and the capacitance come to go to zero. So the velocity factor has an element in right. that so, so that you know how soon that it's going to get to the end. Your coax and everything has an effect on it, but it's when the inductance and capacitance all cancel out, and the only thing left is the resistance portion of that impedance. That's the resonance. I've always defined it as the quality of the match between the radio and the antenna. Correct, because ideally <coughs> you would want none of the inductance capacitance. You just want the resistance. That's the perfect situation, and that's the resonant point. We're going to see this in the modeling. Okay, ideal impedance of 50 ohms. Length is the number one thing that affects your impedance of your antenna. You need to remember that. The length of your antenna is the number one thing. But there are other things. The width of your antenna. How bad is it? Nearby objects. Set it next to your fridge going to act a whole lot different and it will affect the impedance. Ground is a huge effect on the impedance. The farther away or the higher you get above ground, the less effect it has. But that has a huge effect on impedance. Okay. Here I have a little graph. <clears throat> this is pulled out of one of my, in fact, it's out of the textbook that I used when I was in college, I still have that, and that was a long time ago, because it is a great book on antennas. It's antenna theory. It will not tell you how to build a great HF antenna. It's antenna theory. They go into the math that nowadays you just plug into a program. But it's a great book. It's written by the number one person in the world that was known for antenna theory stuff. Uh, many, many years ago, um, Krauss, um, and he wrote this book, but uh, it's an old book. Antenna theory has never changed. The only thing that's changed is using the theory to create different styles of antennas, but the theory has never changed. Okay, this little chart here, oops. If we look at this, we have a bunch of little semicircles here. And if we start down at this corner, we see a point one, and we follow it up to a point two, a point three, a point four, and scroll around to a point five, a point six, a point seven, a point eight, point nine, down to one point oh. This is an impedance chart of a vertical antenna based on length. These point numbers is how many wavelengths long, or tall, in this case, the antenna is. This quarter wave for vertical for two meters, if I come <laughs> over here and pick something between the point 0.2 and point 0.3, it would be somewhere in this area. At point 0.25. And then we look at 
If we draw a line straight down from the point 0.25, I cross this line right here. Halfway between 0 and 100 is what number? 50 ohms. The ideal would be it's crossing the line right at the 50 ohms. Now, if we go up a little bit, we add this number we call the X number, plus 100. In this case, that's the inductance. If we go down shorter, we add some minus, which is the capacitance, which we won't get into how to deal with in this class, in this little discussion. But our goal is to try to get it around the 50 ohm area. Now, this quarter of <coughs> vertical, you notice, it isn't quite. In fact, it's a little higher than up here. It's got a little inductance to it. But our radio can handle a little bit of that. It doesn't have to be perfect. Maybe your SWR can be 1.3. The radio will work just fine. In fact, they actually purposely try to get the quarter wave to, because if you look where it crosses the line, which is what we call the resonant point, it's a little less than 50. It's actually down around 36, 37 ohms. Radio's okay with that. SWR maybe 1.5, but the radio can deal with that. A lot of times they like to push the up a little bit because it actually raises the resistance a little bit and let the radio take care of the little bit of plus inductance that it has. Now, the thing that's neat to look about this, let's lengthen our antenna and make it longer. Let's go clear out here to point, uh, let's say up where it crosses this line, point four three maybe. So point four three times a wavelength. And so we're talking the maybe something that's uh, 40 inches tall, roughly as a guess, on two meters. What's the impedance <coughs> of the feed point of that antenna? <coughs> the resistance was this line right here, and if we follow the solid line, we're out here to 470 <coughs> or something, 470 ohms. Well, your radio can't deal with 470 ohms. That's too far away from 50. So in order to use that antenna, now you've got to have a matching section of some kind down at the little base of your antenna. A very popular length of a 2 meter single band antenna is how long? The number one 2 meter mobile antenna on a car is how long? Five eight yes, a 5 8 wave. <coughs> There's reasons why it's 5 eighths. That wasn't just a random number that was picked. If we follow this chart around, well, there's 0.5. 5 eighths is 0.625. If we follow the chart around, 0.6, it brings us right back up over into here. Well, now we've got a fairly low resistance. We have a little bit of minus here, but the minus is really easy to cancel. This is a 5 8 wave antenna for 2 meters. We had to get rid of that little minus 100 or whatever it is there, but that's really simple tuning to get rid of that. In this case, all it takes is a 3 or 4 turns of wire down to build in the little plastic base, and you've gotten rid of it. And so they're very common. 5 8 wave is just happens to work out to be a great length. Now, there's another reason when we get into talking about the pattern that you'll see why another reason why it's a popular length. If we continue down and we continue going around, it makes the circular pattern. Now, remember I mentioned the width of your antenna has an effect on this? The dotted line is actually a fatter antenna. If you make your antenna fatter, the resistance, it, the impedance all comes down. Is that key? Yes, it is. In fact, the I didn't, uh, um, I don't. You can't see the other side of this. Oops. This is a dipole over on this side, and this is a really skinny wire. Look how high the resistance is. Almost uh, 3,400 ohms. Well, your radio can't handle 3,400 ohms. In fact, there's some tuners that can't handle 3,400 ohms on the HF either. That's a pretty high resistance. But if you make your antenna fatter, 
It improves the cue of the antenna and all kinds of things. Now, we just, we won't get into the real technical details on that, but it's one of the things that affects it. Okay, let's go on. Okay, review of antenna impedance. The number one item that affects an antenna's impedance is what? The length. There are other things that control it, the width, nearby objects, how high above the ground, which we're not really going to get into here, but the length is the biggest effect. The pattern. The pattern is where the signal goes when it leaves your antenna. Number one thing that affects the pattern is the orientation. Okay. The same answer as it is for a The length. The number one thing that affects your pattern is the length. <coughs> There's other things that also affect it, <laughs> such as the ground, other nearby objects, but the number one thing is still the length. Length is the master number one thing that controls all antennas and how well they work. And then you get into all the surrounding things that also get into that, into play with that. Uh, and the previous thing on the Spiral chart there. Yep. I looked and it, you can see what one or one one is not 0.5 or whatever, but where one one is. Yep. And it had some pretty interesting characteristics there that I wouldn't have expected because one wavelength would be, should be, right, the optimal antenna. Which is not. And we'll get into, when you get into the pattern, you may, see, you may say, okay, one wavelength. Especially that longer, it kind of is a, is a low in resistance. Your radio might deal with it. But we're going to show you why you may not want to do that. Because when you get into the pattern, that's the other piece of it that is hugely affected by how long your antenna is. The other thing, I have to operate mainly out of the attic with my antenna because I'm in an HOA restricted area. Mm -hmm. And I have to be sure that I don't try to tune the antenna when it's down on the ground, but tune it when it's up in the attic because there is quite a difference. Because ground makes a huge effect. Yeah. And also <coughs> nearby objects when you get up in the attic. Nearby yeah. objects. you got yeah. wires in your attic. Yeah, wires yeah. and duct work and all kinds of fun stuff. So being similar to things has a huge effect on the antenna. And the effect of radials? Uh, oh, I mean the radials? Radials. Very numerous. Oh, yes. Very much so. Yes. It's a nearby object that becomes part of the antenna. Okay, antenna gain is how much of your signal can be directed to go in a specified direction. We talked about that. Think of a flashlight. If you take the little reflector bulb off the top, it shines light everywhere. You put the little reflector thing back on, the light doesn't get less. It just changes all the signal. All your light goes out the direction you want it to go now. But it's still the same amount of overall light. Antenna gain, your antenna is not radiating any more signal. It's just directing it in the direction. Hopefully it's the direction you want, but it may not be in the direction you want, but it just directs it. Okay, we're going to talk about the radiation pattern of a vertical antenna. Okay. This comes out of this book that I have. And let me explain this. This is the length of the antenna, and it's over a perfect ground. Now, perfect grounds don't exist, but at the higher frequencies, they're actually not that hard to create. It's the big, flat sheet of metal is the perfect ground. Actually, if you're doing a 440 antenna or two meters, and you're putting it on top of uh, your band, in the middle of the band, that's a really good ground plane, actually, because it's actually fairly large sheet of metal that's relatively flat. But a perfect ground would be a nice huge field of some kind of metal and your antenna sitting in the middle of it, your little vertical antenna. If the antenna right here is a length 0.25, that's one quarter wavelength, this short little one here, this is the radiation pattern that you could expect. It's the solid line right here. It's a nice big semicircle. Now, generally speaking, for two meters, 440 <coughs> repeater type of use around here, we want all of our signal to go straight out from us. Unless we're trying to work something that's up there. 
then we maybe want some signal up there. But for most of us, we want signals to go out. And so this shows you as representation as a nice semicircle. Now what if we make that antenna a half wavelength long? Here is the half wavelength, 0.5, and it's the dotted line. It's sending more signal out, straight out, than the quarter wave does. That antenna has gain in the straight out horizontal direction. If we go up to 0.52a, that has a little bit more. We jump over to the other side, 0.64. That's just a little bit over 0.625, which is 5 eighths. If we look at the little number down here on the bottom where it crosses the line, 276, and then we go back here, even the half wave is 236. Four well, five eighths wave has more gain along the ground. In fact, as it turns out, the 0.64 is the theoretical maximum gain you can get off of a vertical antenna. <coughs> so not only does it give you an impedance that's in a relatively nice way to match, it also gives you the maximum signal going out to the sides, which is usually what you want. So 5 eighths waves are just magical antennas, that length. Now what happens if we continue to go taller, 3 quarter wave? Here's the 3 quarter wave long. It's this dashed line up here. Okay, wow, I'm sending a whole lot of energy up in the sky. And there's a little bit of it down here along the ground. <coughs> Very little of it. Isn't that what I want with an HF radio though, is to go up so I can bounce off the... It depends on what you want to talk to. Yeah. Because on HF, if you want to talk a lot of DX, you want to keep that low down. So it goes a long way before it hits the ionosphere and bounces back. East bench is a killer. <laughs> it all just goes into there, and then because that mountain does not pop back. No, it does not. <laughs> I don't turn it around. It just soaks up that energy drain. I don't want to talk to people in Seattle. Have my fill with them. But if you want to talk to, if you want to talk to Denver, then you want an antenna that you could talk to Denver with, which is a much higher angle. In that case, a three-quarter wavelength would be an ideal antenna on HF to talk to Denver. Now, nobody can put a three-quarter wavelength antenna up on 80 meters, however, unless they have a lot of money and a lot of property, but, um, because it's just unmanageable to do that. Now, if you notice on the 5 8 wave, or right out here, if we come back and draw this solid, we got a little bump up here. At that point, even though it's got the best gain straight out, it's starting to create a little signal going up at very high angles. And we would actually call it wasted energy, <coughs> but it depends on what you want. And we'll get into talking a little bit more about this when we get into the modeling, and I'll show you an example from my house looking at the Mount Ogden repeaters. And we're going to talk about that. Okay, antenna modeling. Now we're getting into the modeling stuff. Because we cover the basics, we're going to get into the actual modeling. There's antenna modeling programs. There's several out there. Models are only as good as the data entered into them. It's any computer program. <coughs> you put bad data in or don't put the data in, you're going to get bad results out. It can only do as good as the data that you put into the program. But there are some things you can leave out once you understand some antennas, the, oh, I really don't need to put that in, and that's really hard to guess what that number will be anyway, so I'm just going to ignore it, and that's where it just comes with experience. They provide the radiation pattern, the impedance, and other things like SWR. Several programs are available. The one used most of the time for ARRL articles is called EZNEC. Now, someone brought that up earlier. Easy NEC. If you bought an antenna handbook, which I actually have one here, um, they gave you a little freeware version of Easy NEC. It was limited in what it could do. Uh, very simple antennas, but it got you introduced to it. You could buy it. I've owned the version of 
easy NEC for a number of years. I think I paid 80 or 90 dollars for it uh, 10 years ago. Um, it is now freeware. As of January 1, the guy retired. He's 85 years old. He said he's done supporting this no more. And so he's made it available. And you, there's the website. And you can go onto his website. And he's actually made it available. No more support. If there's a burpee thing in it, that's too bad. Is he making the code available too? Yes. So the entire program, however, there's a couple of versions of the program that he doesn't own. He wrote it for, who is it? One of the universities. Carnegie? He wrote it for one of the universities. And they actually own a couple pieces of the code. But the, but the version of the program itself is available for anybody to use and you can download it. And the core of the program is uh, a program that was made available by the government years ago. Correct. Easy NEC and, and W8 NEC, and there's, a, there's a, several different ones. They just wrapped it in different interfaces. But the core of it is public domain. Correct. The NEC, which is the core piece of it, that's been out in the world for a long time. And there are <coughs> different interfaces to it. And Easy NEC is, is the one that most people have been using in the ham radio world. You can go download it. Uh, and you can get it now. You can get it going to the website. I am not an expert with this, but can do basic things with the program. I don't get into the really hardcore details, but I've had a lot of fun with it and I've learned a lot of things by playing with it. I've learned, especially when you get into the HF antennas, oh, that's interesting what that wire does, or at least what it predicts what that wire is going to do. And so, now, at this point in time, I'm going to go actually run the program. So, can you look at what, like, for example, I have set up and tell me how good it is? Yes, I can. Okay. If you can describe it in great detail. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> it all depends on how well you can describe it. This bailing twine with bubble gum, and then I hung it from a tree. I don't have an option for bubble gum. <laughs> or, or duct tape. <laughs> so the the user interface, they tried to simplify all the math portion of it. This is the basic user interface for the version that I have. Like say it's a 10-year-old version, it's version 5.0. Um, I'll go through and I explain the things you need to put into it. And then we'll see what it's going to give us. First off, the frequency. I can plug in any frequency I want. It calculates the next line, which is the wavelength. I have a frequency on this particular one of 14.2 megahertz. So that's the 20 meter HF band. The wires is the elements of the antenna. Remember, this is, this is one element. So if I was going to do a little antenna like this, I'd have one element. If I was going to do a more complicated antenna, each little element piece of it is a wire. And so you actually create these things in a chart. And you plug in, there's an N1 and an N2, and you have to understand rectangular coordinates in a graph, X, Y, and Z. Z is the elevation or the distance above ground. X and Y would be in this case, if you define y is north, you could say x is east, and then you draw where your antenna, that end is, you go to the other end of the antenna, and you specify the length there. This one happens to have, um, we have, well, let's go pull up an actual antenna. I'll explain this. Let's go pull one. My two meter vertical. So that, that, that makes it pretty hard to use <coughs> these coordinates to describe a, a V shape. In which I have a yes, it does. does However, it it will, it's capable of putting things like if you define a square shape and you tell it the basic what you want square, it'll plug it all in. So it has the capability of picking some pre programmed shapes out of it. Now, you get really weird. You can't do that. You've got to figure out how to manually do that. But a lot of times you can come up with approximations 
which will give you reasonable results. So it, it does it by using predefined shapes, or does it do it by having enough points that you have to define? Both. All Is depends on the shape of your antenna. antenna. You got an antenna that's got lots of corners and angles and it's a big long wire, you can actually define the different points. Or you come up with an approximation of it. So it's points or defined shapes. Yep. Not There's only a couple of shapes it's capable of automatically doing. I generally deal with straight lines in it. So everything I've done is typically straight lines. Uh, when you have a Z, that's zero, that's on the ground, or the bottom of your antenna. In this case, this antenna is on the ground, and it made this comment here. This point is connected to ground. It just made that assumption, because it assumes you're at the bottom. And I have the same X and Y, which means I'm going to the same point, and I go up to 45 inches. Now I can change that to any length I want. We're going to leave this at 45 inches for now. I come down here and it asks me the diameter. In this case, 0.125, that's one eighth of an inch, which is about the diameter of something like that. This is roughly about an eighth of an inch. So you plug in, this is a very simple wire, it's a straight little vertical antenna. So now we can come down and we look at what they call sources. That's the feed point of the antenna. <coughs> yeah, it may be, it's a little harder to read because your stuff is shrunk. <laughs> but um, sources is the feed point. It's where you would hook the coax, whatever, however you're going to feed your antenna. That's the source. And you can place it anywhere you want to place it. And the program will actually allow you to place it. And in this case, I told it wire number one, zero percent from the end one, which I consider the bottom of the antenna. It can't do perfectly zero, so it goes up 2.5 percent, really close to the bottom. You can actually specify how many volts, the angle, all the details on your feed point. I don't usually do that. I just leave that to the defaults. Loads. If you have a long wire antenna on HF and you want to put a resistive load on the end of it to give it directivity, which we're not going to get into, you can actually give this thing loads. You can specify transmission lines, which I don't get into in this program. You can plug in different transmission lines or characteristics and it's capable of taking it. Transformers, L networks, all of that you can plug in. Ground type. We have some choices. If we were going to have an antenna in free space, someone give me a definition of free space. Nothing around it. <laughs> nothing around it. <laughs> if it's in space, you have an antenna with nothing to get in the way, no nearby objects of any kind, that would be free space. Now, we don't have free space here on this earth anywhere, unless we go into space. But we can actually plot an antenna, assuming that nothing is around it. I don't use that one very often, but it's good for instructional purposes. Perfect. It has a perfect ground. I defined that, remember, a big, large sheet of metal. Really large. Your antenna sitting in the middle of it. Or, we can also choose what we call real. It takes the best guess as to what it thinks my backyard is. And it takes lots of guesses, and it kind of simulates, okay, Somebody's backyard has got some grass in it and a little bit of watering once in a while and some dirt and <laughs> rocks and comes up with a basic ground approximation. For this, we're going to leave it on the perfect because I'm dealing with a little vertical. I can specify the loss of my wires. Units, do I want it inches, feet, meters? In this case, I'm going to have it on inches. Now, the plot type. Azimuth plot would be the signal pattern that you would see if you look straight down on your antenna. If I was going to take this thing and I was going to look straight down and I want to look at the pattern, that would be the azimuth of the antenna. The elevation would be if I wanted to look at the side of the antenna. 
this direction and see what pattern would I get out of it. The 3D looks at all of it, and you can rotate it. We'll show you examples of that. So you can get an overall view, because sometimes you may see some pattern on the others, and you miss a big hunk of where your signal's going. And you need to see the 3D view of that. Okay, so right here, we have the azimuth angle. Well, that's, it's a little harder to conceptually view that. It's easier to explain that later. Step size, uh, reference level, I always leave those as defaults. So I'm a guy, guy, I got a 146 megahertz, 45 inches. Let's go down and view this antenna. It draws a picture of it for us. Now, it's a little hard to see because the projector is not really, really bright. But there's little dots along the z-axis, and there's actually a green line drawn on it. You really can't quite see that, probably. And down at the bottom, there's a little dot. This little circle down here is the feed point. That's the source. As they say, I can put that anywhere I want to put it. In this case, I put it at the bottom. And if I just hold this over it, it tells me that wire is 45 inches tall. The segment length is it breaks the little wire up into little pieces for the calculation. And I can tell it how many little pieces to break it up. The more you break it up, the more accurate the calculation. But with simple antenna, it doesn't really matter much because it's not going to change much. Now, I can rotate this and look at any view of it. Let's look at the SWR of a 45 inch tall antenna on 2 meters. I here I specify the start frequency of what it's going to calculate. I'm going to go up to, from 140 to 150 megahertz. It's going to calculate it every 2 tenths of a megahertz, or every 200 kilohertz. I'm going to click the run. Oh yes. This is the chart. Now, <coughs> this is over here is the SWR. In this case, look, this line is really high. And I can actually drag my little point across. Can you see the numbers changing down below? If we pick in the middle of a two meter band somewhere up in here, it says my SWR is 26. Is that a little high? <laughs> <laughs> it is, but it's 45 inches, it's not a quarter wave, it's a little long, SWR is really high, <coughs> and you can see these numbers, this is the impedance, I usually look at the second number of the impedance right here, in particular this one right here, because that's the resistive element of the impedance, and as you move this, you can see that change. Now this antenna, is going to require a matching something at the bottom of it in order for your radio to light it. Because your radio will not be able to use that directly. So it's going to involve some matching network in order to make it work. So let's, oh, while we're here, okay, <coughs> this FF plot. This is the plot. That is what we're going to look like for the pattern looking straight on sideways to the antenna. Remember the little one out of the textbook? It kind of looks like that. And I can drag my little pointer, and it actually will tell me the elevation of where my little sample that is reading this from. It gets almost all of its energies going straight out, but it's just starting to develop a little bump here. A true half wave, that little bump would not be there. But as you start getting longer than a half wave, you start getting a little bump. Now let's go up here, and let's change this to old 19.5. And let's redo all of this. First, let's do the SWR.
Oh, now look at it. It's really low. We direct my little pointer out here to the middle of the two-meter band somewhere. It says SWR is 1.38. Oh, now my radio is going to like that. And the J number, which is the, the impedance, the, the inductance or capacitance, is a very low number. The radio is not going to care about that. You notice it's about 37 ohms, which is a little low, which is why it's not 1.1, 1 1.38. It's not quite 50 ohms, but it's reasonably close. Your radio is going to be happy with it. And as I change the frequency, you can see it's very broad-banded. Covers the whole band really easily. So I move it back and forth. And if I go look at the plot, oh, now we get the big semicircles that we saw out of the textbook. Now this, we're going to go back and change this to 45 inches again, what we were with it before. I'm going to replot this, and I have redone, plotted the quarter wave, two meter, and we're going to put them on top of each other. And you can see the difference. Along the horizon, these little notches are dB. I have two and a half dB gain from the quarter wave to the roughly half wave length antenna. The half wave length antenna, most people consider, has more gain. 5 8 wave would be actually out just a little bit further. It's closer to 3 dB. However, you got to be careful when you talk about the gain. It's where do you want the signal to go. From my house in Roy, if I look at the Mount Ogden repeaters, they are actually up at an 8 degree elevation from my house. If I drag my little line up here to where I got about 8 degrees, and it tells me that right there, <coughs> Which antenna is going to put the most signal into the Mount Ogden repeaters? Which of these two antennas? Not the quarter. The half. It's actually going to be the half. The half is the one that's the farthest out. It has the most signal. The half. You're actually about seven inches longer than the half. Right? Yes. It's a rough approximation. So I'm actually a little longer than half. I just picked 45. Close to a 5 8 Correct. I'm actually closer to a 5 8 Yeah, 5 8 um, is real common for vertical or for uh, mobile antennas because it is. As you're traveling up and down the road, you want more of that signal to go to where? Other vehicles on the road. So to get that there, you need that flatter, longer drive. Is correct. However, if you're in downtown Ogden, and you want to put the most signal into the Mount Ogden repeaters, do you think you could have maybe a 45 degree angle? 60? 30 anyway. Now which antenna has the most signal going up to the repeaters? The quarter wave. So if you're driving around downtown Ogden and your main interest is to get into the repeaters on top of the mountain, you're better off with a quarter wave antenna on top of your car, not a 5 8. If you do a lot of driving through Ogden Canyon, which antenna is going to bounce and get up to the repeaters better? The quarter wave is. Because it's putting more signal up in the air. But if you're in my place in Roy, and I'm looking at the repeaters, well, the half of the 5 8 wave is going to be the better antenna. So you got to be really careful when you say the one has more gain than the other, because it's where do you want your signal to go. Generally speaking, the 5 8 waves are considered the, the perfect antenna for most people in most situations, but you got to be careful on how you do that. If I wanted to talk to an airplane or a satellite that was flying overhead, what would be the better antenna? The quarter wave because it gives me more signal going up at a high angle. So you got to be cautious when you say, well, that has more gain. It may have more gain in one condition, but not in another situation. What effect does the diameter of the radiating element uh, have on the SWR curve? 
it affects the SWR, not a lot of the SWR, depending on the length. If you go back to the original chart, and as the diameter gets bigger, the radiation resistance actually comes down, but it typically only comes down when it's really high. If you look at the little circle, and as you get fatter, it gives you increases your, your Q. It allows you to operate a wider bandwidth because the impedance doesn't change as much as you start making it different lengths. In fact, they actually you can actually take a make a two meter antenna. And, well, they actually they have the things called disco antennas, um, but you can take a really fat antenna you, and you can take a bucket for two meters, make it really fat, but only this tall. You could probably operate. 40 megahertz wide signal, and the SWR still fine. So I'm thinking of three quarter inch copper. When you go from an eighth inch to a three quarter inch, there will be a slight effect, but not, it's only not uh, enough to uh, consider. No, not enough to probably consider. So those antennas, the, 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 the one or whatever it is that uses the, 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 the four inch PVC pipe sheet of aluminum, yep, is taking advantage of that. It is. Take advantage of that. They're very broad banded antennas. They still give you the same gain. They're very broad banded. They're harder to make, but they take advantage of that. This might be beyond the scope of your discussion here today, but the imaginary part of your antenna there is mm -hmm. also a part of your uh, SWR, if you will. It is. So what is, I, I guess what I'm looking for, what is a small number? I mean, obviously, two it depends is smaller on the frequency. Five. Depends on the frequency. Okay. At the lower frequencies, you can live with a larger number because it, the number is controlled. That impedance capacitive reactance, it becomes a much less of an effect as the frequency goes down. Okay, so at 160 <coughs> meters, you can tolerate a larger number oh, yes. than you could at 70. Five or 600 ohms easily in the impedance area, no issue with 160. Okay, so it's going to be frequency dependent. So there is no answer there, just correct. a small number. Correct. Okay. And generally, if it's just got some extra impedance in the imaginary areas you bring up, if it's like capacitance and you need to get rid of that, Capacitance typically is easier to get rid of because you can put it with an inductor, and an inductor is easy to build. If it's the reverse, you have to do the reverse. You have to add some capacitance to get rid of it. All part of the matching network. So I'm assuming there's some higher level math there to take that number and figure out there is. what that number means as far as capacitance so that you can cancel it. That is correct. There's, there's math involved in doing that, and so if you want to have a class sometime in that kind of thing, there's math involved in doing that kind of thing. Okay. <laughs> okay, now, this is the basic concept. I'm going to show you a couple of other antennas, and then we're going to actually model one, because I've heard him talking about it a lot, and he's not even here. No, Alan. You <coughs> oh, put up Alan's antenna. Jay <laughs> did, that's what I thought. Gene's um, the name you're looking for. Yeah, Gene's not here though, is he? No. no. Well, from what I remember from the talking about it on the air, we're going to actually put it up and see it. And we're going to see what it does. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of uh, an antennas. I'm going to show you my 80 meter antenna. <coughs> I do. He didn't say it was a good one. It actually works really good. Probably works better than I have a 45 foot tower on my lot, the back of my house. That 45 foot tower is mounted into the ground, got guy wires. Remember, I have a little city lot that I put it up in the air long before there's evidence about such a thing. Nowadays, I couldn't do that. Yeah, this is near, near for us. But uh, I have a 45 foot tower, and I wanted to use that for my 80 meter vertical. And so, what I did is I buried in my ground a whole bunch of radials, buried in my lawn. They're relatively easy to bury. And then I fed my 80 meter tower. 
Now, we won't get into all the technical details about the feed, but that's what this little bump is on the side right here. And then I, there's my little source, the little round thing. That's my feed point. Mel. I'd like to tell you a little story about that. When I was a young kid, my dad had bought hundreds of feet of stainless steel fuel lines to the Air National Guard in their aircraft. And he had me dig all these radials out from his antenna. I couldn't figure out what he was doing. But he was putting in a sprinkler system. But it was made of stainless steel, and it all radiated out from his antenna. <laughs> and it was many years later before I figured out what he did. But that was one of the best ground planes in the neighborhood. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not everyone can do that. <laughs> but this is my... 80 meter antenna. At the top I have this little bar. I have a Yagi up on top, an HF Yagi. And so I put some little pieces up there that represent that. And it goes down to the ground and I actually match it up at uh, about 10 feet off the ground where I match it. So you can see all the different angles of this. Now, if we go do the SWR from 3 to 5 megahertz, covers the 80 meter band. Look at this. This shows a little dip out here at 4.2 megahertz. Well, that's a little high. But now my antenna tuner can easily tune that. And actually, my dip is actually down a little lower, so I didn't model it perfectly. There's probably more numbers I can put into it, which I didn't. I took some guesses. But it actually gave me a reasonable representation. Hey, this antenna is actually somewhat got a reasonable resonance point for 80 meters. And so it actually works. In fact, uh, down here at uh, 4 megahertz, uh, I purposely kind of designed it for 3.9 megahertz. Well, I'm, my resistance element right there is 298, 300 ohms. Well, my tuner can easily handle 300 ohms, no problem. And the J is only 110 can easily handle that. So I can use my standard antenna tuner on HF and it'll have no problem operating this antenna on 80 meters. Now, does it really work? If we go look at the plot, in this case, I'm going to show you a 3D plot. That's the 3D plot. This is looking from the side, and so it's got a very nice pattern going out. And it's got a big notch dipped down in the middle. The vertical antennas don't radiate out the end of the antenna. And it's nice, very perfectly circular, which is what it ought to be for a vertical antenna. And so you can get an idea of what it looks like. Now, I did the same kind of thing for 160 meters. Only in this case, my 160 meter trying to match my tower tower wasn't anywhere near long enough, not tall enough to do that, but uh, um, I put a little pole in my backyard, it's 18 feet from ground to the top, and I actually matched it for 160 meters. Now, making that match for 160 meters would be like a rubber duck that's only two inches tall. It works, but it doesn't work really well. But it's better than nothing. <laughs> and I'll show you one of the reasons why it works, but it doesn't work really well. 160 meter vertical. And let's go look at it. In this case, it is stuck on the corner of a chain link fence junction. This little green segment, which say I don't think you can see the green, but it's right there. Is the top of the antenna, 14 feet from the top of the chain link to the top of the antenna. There's the little circle, that's where I have the, I'm feeding it at. These pieces coming out are the chain link fence. And I actually ran some little wires along the chain link fence to make sure they were connected. Galvanized steel doesn't connect really well electrically to each other. And so it's a very simplistic, poor man's antenna. But it actually did work, but it has some great issues with it. Let's go look at the SWR. I'm going to run it from 1.8 to 2 megahertz. Where's my SWR? Whoa, it's 
super huge and high. Come on, drag that. Mm -hmm. Let me drag it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, maybe. Let's go down and look at this number right here. The resistance, 0.68 ohms. Is that a little low compared to 50? Extremely low. When it comes to antennas, when you get really low numbers, they become highly, highly lost. Which means that probably 90% of my energy that I'm feeding it is going into burning up and creating heat and soaking up in the ground. Highly inefficient antenna. But I actually created a matching network for it. At the base of this 160 meter antenna, I've got a piece of 6 inch PVC pipe about 12 inches long with 10 gauge wire wrapped around it. Now 10 gauge is bigger than house wire. But where I first got the indication that it was as lossy as it was, if I go in my house and I take my radio, HF radio, and I hold my key down for one minute only, um, 100 watts, and I walk back out to my backyard and touch that coil, it is hot. Really hot. That's how much heat it's creating because it's so lossy because that, that resistance value is so low. When you get to really low values, it almost becomes a worthless antenna. But it does work, and I can make CW contacts <coughs> on it. I could never make a phone contact, but I wouldn't dare. I, I only operated at 50 watts. You know, I worry about the heat it creates. It gets warm, but it, I can make a CW contacts on it. So then I got this wild idea and said, well, how could I ever make that better? So I went and I did something a little different, and I... You should go five words a minute, otherwise you'll keep it up. Yes. You can Actually, <laughs> short contacts only. <laughs> Thank you. Five then. I took my tower that I have, and I attached the wire up near the top, and I ran it down to the back corner of my lot, and I feed my feed point to the 160 meters on this end of this wire, and then I attach it on the ground right there. And so now, I move my, right here is where my little vertical is, same point, only I didn't put that in here. And so now I feed this, and so now it's got this length of wire, which actually turns out to be 61 feet long, attached to the top of the tower. And so this whole thing becomes my antenna. It's grounded all the bottom end out here. I was curious if it would make any difference. And so I went and I did this, and let's go look at our SWR, the same thing we did before. It's still very high. And now look at my resistance, 7.2. I'm more than 10 times what it was before. Still low, but I'm probably only losing 50% of my signal now. So I've just effectively increased the effectiveness of that antenna a great deal. In fact, because that number came up high enough, I don't have a matching network. I can feed the coax into my shack, and I can use a regular antenna tuner I will admit my antenna tuner is actually an enhanced antenna tuner, but I can tune it inside my shack. Because it's high enough, I can actually work with it now. Can you keep your shack warm at the same time? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so there are still losses here, but they're not near the losses they were before. And now I'm not relying on this chain link fence near as much as I was before because I got a much longer antenna, and it actually works. Still, not exactly an ideal antenna, but there is nothing ideal for that low of an HF band. It's a compromise no matter what you do. But I was curious what it would do, and it actually does work better. I can actually hear a little bit better, and I can tell that I can send out a little bit better. I can work stations a little bit better. They don't have to be an S9 signal in order for them to hear. That's what it was before. Okay, now we're going to go do one more. Uh, and this one is, I've heard Alan in 7HH talk about his long wire. So I thought, well, okay, let's go and actually model this. 
This is how I think it is from all the descriptions they talked about on the repeater. This X, Y, Z would be the bottom point of his antenna. And then he runs a wire 15 feet in the air, which I think is the side of his house. And he, that's his ground. He just runs it up to, from the ground up to the side of the antenna. In this case, he has an actual, what we call a ballon there, but we won't really get into that. And uh, an eighth of an inch in diameter, I took a wild guess on it. Won't matter much. And then I go from this 15 foot point. This is the main radiating element. I think he said it's about 225 feet long. And I think he said it goes about 40 feet tall into a tree way out in the backyard somewhere. That's what, that's what I remember. And I think he said it kind of goes easterly, if I remember right. You know, this fr from his house almost straight. <coughs> oh, okay. So I have it rotated 90 degrees. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, but the, this will still illustrate that. In fact, I could change this. And I could go 225 feet and go back here and go to zero. And now it will go north. <laughs> and so let's go look at the antenna. There's the antenna. Y is, would be north if we define that as north. There's the antenna sitting out there. And I define a piece of what I would call real ground or their wild approximations of the ground. So how well does that antenna actually work? Let's do an SWR first. Oh, I need to change. Oh, I did 20 meters. He uses an all band. The 20 is where he's eyed a lot. So I picked 20 meters. And I'm going to go do the SWR from 13.5 to 15 megahertz to include the 20 meter band. There's his antenna, the SWR. Now look, it's relatively high. But he, at the base of his antenna, he actually has what we call an 8 to 1 ballon or union, same concept. Yeah. It takes whatever impedance and divides it by 8. Well, up in here, we got 800 ohms, divide it by 800 ohms. Well, his antenna tutor can easily take care of 100 ohms, no problem at all. And so he can use a standard antenna tuner and he can tune it, he uses it for tune it for any man. So it's actually, he can actually tune this. <coughs> now what kind of a signal does it actually radiate? We're going to do a 3D plot. So I'm going to look straight down on it. Now look, the direction that the antenna is going, set is north, I actually have a notch in the north. Well, that's interesting. It actually has a notch up there. It doesn't send near as much energy going north. I would, you'd think the other way around, but no. Yeah, but it's actually got a, reason, a bump going off the side, up, up the bottom end. In fact, what's most interesting is you start, as you look at the side view of this, this is the north up here, this is the south. He actually puts a really low angle off the back side, which we call the coax key. So if he wanted to talk to South America, Hey, it's actually a reasonable antenna for talking to South America. It's actually a, a reasonable HF antenna looking down from the top. It's not exactly round, but it does reasonably well. So that gives you a kind of a guess as to what it's going to look like. Now let's go back and change this to 100 feet. And we're going to do the same thing. Oh! <coughs> That's looking down from the top. I got some different shapes now. Now I got some big knolls in this antenna. From the side, it looks very different than the other one did. But it gives you an idea, and actually the longer wire actually is a better pattern than the shorter one. Gives you a better results. Like put in 71 feet, that's what mine is in antenna. Oh, <coughs> 71 feet. Are you about 40 feet on the end? No, unfortunately not. It'll be about 12. <coughs> 12? <coughs> about 15? <coughs> okay. okay, at the okay. end of the antenna, it's about 12 feet high. Yeah. What is it at the beginning of the antenna? Same. Oh, 12 feet? Yeah. 
So let's change this to 12. And it, we'll change this into 12. That could be a reasonable NBIS antenna. <laughs> yes. That's what it is. But I'm going to tell so, Okay. So uh, I'm 12, and it made the connections. I'm 71 feet going north, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. And let's look at the pattern. So actually going north, you got a reasonable, but you have a notch going east and west. Now, could you theoretically take his his attic? Well, this is design, outside. This is free. And, uh, and you, you could. Like, I don't know, <coughs> you put swoops or angles or some crazy you can to get rid of those nulls. Yes, and yeah. you could. And that's where the playing with gets into. You could say, okay, I'm going to wrap this around the corner, around the corner of my yard. How much effect does it do? Now, the thing that I don't, you can't model in. Well, okay, I'm in my house. And I have a whole bunch of electrical wiring in my house. Yeah. No, that all messes it up. This one's outside. So this is totally outside. So <laughs> you're only affected really the ground, unless you have a nearby aluminum shed that's only 10 feet away from the antenna. Right. How about trees? Because I put my vertical between two trees. Trees have an effect, but they're not a huge effect. Okay. But they do have an effect. In fact, there's an article in ARRL three or four months ago um, about the forested areas and antenna. There's they're different in the summer than they are in the winter, too. Yes, because of the leaves. They're no, different. They're different. They're different. And, uh, and the more, yeah, pine tree won't change much from yeah. summer to winter. I mean, yeah. Between pine tree and you pine were just saying, be, saying before that you would that you would use your chain link um, fence. Would that be? Wouldn't you need something much, much, much higher? Well, that was my ground. Okay. It wasn't the main radiating part of the antenna, although it had a great effect on the way the antenna worked. But it was the ground of my antenna. Okay. Was the chain link fence. Now I do not recommend doing that and putting a lot of power out because when you do that and the doggy comes by and goes yeah. wee wee on the fence when you're transmitting, he's probably going to feel it. <laughs> you won't do it again. It, it also causes the worms to come out of the soil. So, but, but, but I'm not, I'm not transmitting a lot of power there. I'm keeping my power relatively low, and in this case, I only use 160 meters in the middle of the night. You know, it's after dark. Um, but uh, so you got to be cautious about that kind of thing. Because my neighbor shares that same chain link fence, and they do have dogs. <laughs> So, so Larry, there's your antenna, and there's kind of what it looks like. And we can on um, we can actually come up with a guess on the impedance the same way on 20 meters. How much effect do the uh, tower? The, yeah, the towers, the antenna towers. It has an effect. How Even much? Yeah. I have not modeled it, so I really so don't know. So it's a small effect, but that can do it. Yes. Yes. In my case, uh, yeah. But it usually outweighs the the uh, effect of having uh, being close in proximity to the ground. Yes. Yep. Yeah. 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 Now, what is the relationship uh, of how high the power needs to be to the uh, size of the antenna? And that we're not really going to get into. Because we can get into a whole bunch of details on the antenna, on how high it really needs to be to make it work. And we really don't have time to get into all of that. Yeah, because there's a whole bunch, we're out of time now. Of course, so, we started a half hour late, but we're out of time. So, so does your so, ground plane have to fall within the size of the antenna? Or are you trying to get something that's larger than the ground That depends on how you do the ground plane. If your ground plane is buried in the earth, you just need a a bunch of them, whatever you can get. One of the good books for this kind of discussion is the antenna book from right. uh, AWRF. Um, There's an older version of it. Yeah, and, and they really haven't changed much over the years. They do add some things and switch some things around, but overall, the one that you can find from the 1950s is about as good as the one that you can get today. So if you can find an old uh, AWRL antenna book, it is a great resource for this kind of thing, and especially for what you're talking about, uh, towers. What do I yeah. use for a tower? How high does it need to be? Right. What about yeah. radials? All that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's all found in that book, right. and it's a great section. Yeah. So. Pick one up on, on eBay if you use eBay or Amazon. They've got to uh, go on there and go ARRL books. 
And you like there'll be all kinds of things. They're not even all that expensive, really, as yeah. far as a good book goes. So, you know, now just to finish off, this is the impedance of your antenna, at least its best guess, around the 40 meter band. And if you look at this, and it actually does have a little dip that says it's 5 to 1 SWR, but it's up at, well, just above the 40 meter band, or it's a 20 meter band. It's actually not that bad. Yeah, if your tuner can handle it easily, it does. Yeah. And so you can use it to play with and to model your antennas in a simplistic way. It's capable of very complicated antennas, which we really didn't get into. My Yagi on top of my tower has 12 elements on it. I have it modeled, and it actually looks reasonably close to what it actually is. You can do all that kind of stuff. It's just a matter of spending the time to play with it. So modeling is fun. You can learn a lot from it. Just remember, we'll go back and we'll close down. All antennas are compromises. You must decide what works for your situation and what compromise you can live with. All HF antennas are compromised versions of the same thing that can be done at two meters or higher frequencies. A Yagi antenna is just a specialized collection of half-wave dipoles mounted close to each other so that each element affects other nearby elements. A rubber ducky antenna on a handheld is a highly compromised vertical dipole. Yes. And we didn't get into the impedance matching or what's a practical HF antenna or even the new satellite antennas. Those are all different things. But I think that gave an idea of what you can do with modeling you can have a lot of fun with it. You can really get into detailed stuff. Some of the articles in, in QSD, they get some really detailed stuff. Somebody obviously has a lot of time on their hands. Um, but you can really get into doing some neat stuff. Okay, Thank questions you. real quick. Well, there's one thing I probably will always, I, I keep having to tell myself, is that every antenna that you'll in, uh, encounter that, that has a transmitting aspect is a dipole. It's, it's just, it's just what another. those two ends are c consist of. Whether yeah. it whether it's a grounding plane or another element, just like the one that that you're radiating from or whatever, they're all dipoles. You have to have the two elements you do. in order for it to work. Yep. That's why uh, the vertical that we'll be setting up. I think we're going to be using it for winter field day. Has radios. Right. That's that one side of the antenna where the other side is the actual piece that we stand up. Right. That is correct. Yep. I just wanted to address the comment you made early on. You said uh, if you're on FM, you need to be vertical. You don't have to be. You need to match whatever the other station is. F FM two meters. If you're not going on guys. Correct. F that depends on the frequency. FM two meter or VHF UHF repeaters. Right, but the only reason there's, there's, they're not that way because FM works better vertically. They're that way because it was designed for mobile use. Correct. And all mobiles are vertical. That is the only reason. You yeah. can, if you're, if you're trying to communicate with your friend 50 miles away, if you're both horizontal on FM, that's fine. Oh, that works yeah. great. Yeah. Well, sure. Well, and, and then that's that's the the reason why that is is because you know, you've got people that are talking to their radios. I think you know, talking to a radio like this is kind of cool. Because you see it in all the, all the pictures and everything else. It's really cool to talk into your radio like this, right? The problem is you've got the one antenna that's this way, and now you're holding your antenna this way. So your signal ends up being that little bit of space right there. Yeah. You're losing everything else. But if you're right, if, if uh, one guy is talking like this on simplex, and the other guy is talking like this and they're being really cool, then they're both receiving the signal. They're both being like this, then same, same thing. They can both receive their signal because they're the, the same orientation. So I, I don't want to make or anything. The vertical was chosen just because it was the easiest to do. Right. I just want to make sure. I've heard, so many, I've heard people on the air comment on two years at them that they wish they could try side pit, but all they have is the vertical. Oh, that works. It works. It works. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Tell them, you know. Try it. The signal goes down a couple of inch units, and that's okay. I've, I've done it in single side band. Sure. Antenna, that's what I've done. There's a two meter side band that on Monday evening runs out of the Salt Lake area. You can get on it, you can check into it. You can talk to it on the phone. Sure, it works great. Does it get bounced? 
using your signal. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Whereas that's you right. using your moon balance, there is no orientation. That's Whatever what happens goes up right. there and comes back. And that's what happens with like a G5 RV. It's horizontal. Yeah. But the guy on the other end in Morocco doesn't care. Yeah. There isn't that it could be 45 degree. It doesn't matter at that point because that signal is bouncing around so much and it's twisted and everything else. Um, so it, it yeah, it, mostly that only reply, uh, uh, applies to uh, local communications. So when you're talking to the repeater, when you're talking to someone else in the bar, the line of sight stuff. Oh, it's the line of sight stuff that, that it does make a difference. Uh, if you're talking to a repeater from a mountaintop in southern Utah,